So um, this time of the night, Asher's Birkenau is usually uh, empty. A couple of people are leaving. It's very surreal walking up here. But they allowed it to stay slightly open for the het groups. On the left-hand side here, you can see there's a small pond here. And now we begin to understand the craziness of this place. That pond of water is insurance. Essentially, the camp was not allowed to legally be set up without having a source of water that they could use uh, to put out fires if there was a uh, fire in the camp. So for insurance purposes, they needed a source of water, which is that pool over there. They weren't concerned about the fires burning 1.2 million Jews of our brothers and sisters. But nonetheless, this is uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. On the right-hand side over here, I'm just going to show you where the selections were made. This is where the Jews have come in 1944. The tracks were extended down this way over here to that area just beyond where the cattle cart is on the right-hand side. This is where the Jews would arrive and get their welcome greeting from the greetings of Auschwitz-Birkenau, brutally separated five abreast, and would be selected by 24 so-called doctors along with Dr. Mengler as to whether they were going to live or whether they were going to die. Those that were going to live would make their way towards the right. Those that were going to live, excuse me, those that were going to die, destined to die, usually anyone under the age of 16, anyone over the age of 40, pregnant women, older people, disabled, were taken down the route that we're walking now. And it's surreal to think what was taking place 70 years ago. I'm walking around here today as a free Jew. So we're back. But... Uh, Sadly, this journey was a journey that was taken by close to 1.2 million Jews who never had the privilege to walk out of Auschwitz alive again. So there is the uh, one wagon. I'm just going to give you a scope of the size so you understand what's happening over here. And on the left-hand side, we have here the entrance into the women's camp, which you can see on my left here. hope you can see all this because it's a little bit dark. We're now crossing the tracks, as you see, the tracks over here ran from the entrance to the camp all the way down to the end to where the gas chambers were. But the Jews would arrive here on trains. And the trains with the light over here, and this is where the selections were made. This is one train wagon. Just to give you an idea, a scope of the size of what this is. It's not very big, as you can see. This was set up to carry initially 25 horses if not 25 horses, some 40 soldiers. And they placed in here close to 100 to 120 Jews at any one time with no food and no water. Sometimes for a journey up to seven days. Many arrived here already dead, so they never had to go through auschwitz now. <clears throat> this is the site of a tremendous crime. Leslie Kleiman will tell you what will be happening to babies right here when they wouldn't be given up taken by their legs and smashed against the train carriages by Nazis. These are images that he saw on a daily basis and how he sleeps, I do not know. But just to give you one perspective of where we're standing and what was taking place over here. This is a very famous picture of the selections that were taking place, which is from the Auschwitz album from Lady Yaakov. Let me just give you an indication. The camp gate is over there. If we bring this into perspective here with this picture, you can see here the Jews are being selected. The men on the left, women on the right, um, by Dr. Mengler and the doctors. And here we have also the welcoming committee, the Jews already in the striped pajamas, taking the Jews off the trains, telling them to leave their luggage. In the background, you can see the camp gate, which we've just walked through. But that image right here was taking place every day over here between 1933 and 1945. This is the entrance to the women's camp, which is a whole different story. We don't have time to deal with this now. But if we carry on our walk all the way up here, which takes about five minutes, I'm going to turn this off for now. We will come to the area of crematoria number two. Okay, um, rather long walk from down the back over there to where we are now. A walk that sadly 1.2 million Jews will take and would never take again. As they were brutally killed in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Every victim had a name. We have to get out of our minds and our senses the concept of six million Jews that were killed. It wasn't six million Jews that were killed. It was six million murders. Individual murders where every person had a name. 
Every person had an identity, hopes, dreams and aspirations that were ripped away from them in the most brutal way by a bunch of animals. So this is the end of the railway line over here that you can see. This whole area is a memorial that was set up. And I'm going to take you very briefly now. I'll be very serenely by myself in the middle of the night. No one else around. To the site of one of the gas chambers. You can see the dogs barking in the background. So we come to this holy site. Which uh, I don't even know you can see in the light. But essentially... This is the ruins of crematoria number two. The Jews would alight down the bottom over there, there were stairs, and they would come down those stairs into an undressing chamber down here, and then finally make their way into the gas chambers over here, where they were killed and murdered. It is very surreal. Walking around here is the only Jew in Auschwitz, some 70 years ago, I would not have been able to get away with this. Anyway, in a few moments' time, uh, the other students are going to be coming back. They've gone to the place called the Sauna Building, which is beyond those trees. It's a place where the Jews of the camp that were allowed to live, in quotes, uh, were processed. Where their hair was shaved, where they were given the tattoo, where their name was taken, uh, where their identity was ripped away from them. And this is a memorial to the uh, millions of victims that died here. Birkenau, as we know, is called because of these trees at the background, which are the birch trees. Birkenau means birch in German. And here you have the various plaques on the floor which represent the various different people that were killed here. Often you find wreaths and candles that are laid down here and the various monuments that were set up as a memorial. Just beyond over here you have the crematorium number three, further down you have four and five. The back there, those are familiar a little bit with the history. Not far from here you have the White House, which was one of the first gas chambers that was set up here. A place where they exhumed some 100,000 bodies and buried them and burned them in pits. You can still find remnants of bones in there as well. But anyway, I hope that gives you a little bit of an insight as to the magnitude of this place. Even now that we're at the end, of the line the camp still goes on literally for miles you could spend several days here and still not see it all so i'm here with a another trip with het um, i've actually just spoken to 200 students by the uh, latrines about an hour ago and i've now made my way up here to keep the camp open for uh, the het groups longer I'm the lone Jew by the gas chambers here in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, extremely surreal. Thinking 70 years ago, I would not have been able to do this. So, um, yeah, Zichran Baruch. Powerful moment.